Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another video at the Pharmacist Academy! Woo! So the other day a friend who's a pharmacist um, told me that he actually just got a position at a private pharmacy where he has to compound ointments, creams, lotions, etc. And it brought my attention to how diverse the pharmacy career is in terms of opportunities. It made me want to research all the different types of pharmacists practicing in different places and share with you all so we can all appreciate this. Now I'm going to be putting out a lot of these kind of videos and it will help anyone who don't know exactly what to do with your PharmD after graduation. So today I wanted to start with the ID pharmacist because that's always a hot topic. So make sure to leave comments on which other types of pharmacists or pharmacist practicing areas I should cover next. Okay, let's begin. So the infectious disease pharmacist is known as the antimicrobial pharmacotherapy specialist. So that means anything that has to do with antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, antiparasitics, they are the specialists. So they know the indications, the toxicities, drug interactions, different scenarios where you should use one over the other, the different microorganism coverages. Okay, so this is what they specialize in and they basically know these things in and out. Now, what are their roles? So one, use of evidence-based information to select the most appropriate antimicrobials. So this is very important, right, because you want to be able to keep up with guidelines, so that's what they do. They keep up with different guidelines, new research that's released, and they use this information to make clinical decisions and also to educate others who may not be aware of it. Next, advocate for the proper use of antimicrobials through antimicrobial stewardship, also known as ASP, to reduce resistance. Now this is like the bread and butter of infectious disease pharmacists, and sometimes they may use that term interchangeably. So instead of saying infectious disease pharmacists, they may say the ASP pharmacist. And this goes beyond selecting the right drug for the right bug. You also have to consider, let's say, the duration, right? It may be the correct medication, but how long are you actually treating it? So this is something that the ASP pharmacist you know, focuses on. For example, two agents covering the same bug, when to use one over the other, when to do double coverage, when to increase or decrease the dose, drug level monitoring. So sometimes if the levels are very low, like the drug level is very low, it can actually just entertain the bacteria instead of killing it. And this could potentially lead to resistance. So this is a very hot topic. ASP, antimicrobial stewardship, and this is something that organizations such as the Joint Commission, they look for when they survey hospitals, okay? So this is very important for accreditation because this is something that's affecting the whole nation in terms of using antimicrobials inappropriately. Next, collaborate with interdisciplinary team to provide direct patient care. And this is what clinical pharmacists do, right? They work closely with the providers and the nurses and the other members of the team. And what they really do with them is that they do consultations with them, right? So let's say a patient is admitted to the hospital and then the team wants to start antibiotics. They will consult the ID team. And then usually when the physicians are going to see the patient, the pharmacist tags along to make recommendations regarding dosing, renal adjustment, hepatic adjustment, start an IV versus oral, can the medication be crushed, etc. So they will turn to the pharmacist for all these questions. And then the pharmacist also educates them. And also something that I just wanted to throw out there, the infectious disease physicians may also be the same ones that sometimes may use the antibiotics inappropriately. So, you know, having the pharmacist on the team is very important because we are the ones that will let them know that they're not supposed to be, let's say, using double coverage in this case or using this specific medication just to treat a fever with no source of infection, etc. Next, monitor the use of antimicrobials. 
right? So for example, monitoring anti-biograms. And for those of you who don't know what this is, it's like a table that tells you the percentage of, let's say, pseudomonas that was susceptible to a specific medication. So for example, ciprofloxacin, right? So they could say something like for the year 2019, the percentage of pseudomonas that was actually susceptible to ciprofloxacin was 99%. So this is something that the ID pharmacist also has to monitor because it would give them an idea of potential resistance that may be developing in the institution or in the community or whatever the case is. They also do MUEs to evaluate the use of different antibiotics. And this will let them know if the medications are being used inappropriately. So just a little bit more about antimicrobial stewardship. Now just take a look at this picture here. And this is something that you will see a lot in the hospital setting. Sometimes the team or the physician may just, you know, randomly select an antibiotic. And sometimes like, you know, we don't really have a choice, right? Because we are trying to cover something that we really don't know what it is. So even when we don't mean to do this, it just comes with clinical practice, right? So sometimes we are kind of like promoting um, the development of resistance. So that's why it's so important to have a antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist on the team in order to assist with these things to make sure that the cultures are being collected, to make sure that we're stopping the antibiotics when the cultures are negative or they're not growing anything, just to have another person to keep your eye on all of this. So this old pick an antibiotic car trick may lead to unnecessary prescriptions. So at least 30% of prescriptions that are given to patients in U.S. doctor's office or emergency departments, right? And I'm referring specifically to antibiotics in this case, right? So at least 30% of it is unnecessary, right? And even the 70% that is necessary, it still need improvement in terms of drug selection, right? So they could have made a better choice in terms of the dose, the duration. And keep in mind that any mistake in any of these will promote resistance, so these pharmacists practice both on the out, in the outpatient and also the inpatient setting. In the outpatient, in the clinics, you know, it's usually like an infectious disease clinic where they're providing medication therapy management. So let's say the patient will bring all their medications to the clinic. The pharmacists will counsel them on the antibiotics, toxicities, any drug interactions, and educate them on taking the medication completely. In the inpatient setting, in the hospitals, that's where you see the pharmacists conducting more antimicrobial stewardship. They may also be in schools, teaching pharmacy students or even medical students. People who did residencies can actually get into the pharmaceutical companies also, all right? There's different opportunities there for clinical pharmacists. It was kind of difficult to get the exact salary or the average for infectious disease pharmacists specifically. So what I was able to get was the clinical pharmacist salary in America. And that should kind of give you an idea of the amount of money that the pharmacists will make each year. And also you have to take into consideration the location, right? So whether you're in New York, you're in Florida, California, Texas, you know, depending on what state you're in, the salary may increase or decrease. 25% increase in California, 21% increase in New York, and they lose 3% of the median salary in Florida. I don't know how accurate this is because, you know, it also depends on the institution, also depends on, you know, your position, right? Exactly what you're going to be doing. So you could be the infectious disease pharmacist, but you can also be a manager. You can also be preceptor student, or you're the program director of the residency over there. So it may, it may vary, okay? So these are just estimates. Don't take this to heart if you live in Florida, please. <laughs> now, how to become an infectious disease pharmacist? Pretty straightforward, right? You get your PharmD, you do a PGY1 residency, you do a PGY2 residency in infectious diseases, and voila! 
Now, there are 120 ASHP accredited PGY2 infectious diseases residency programs in the country. So as you can see, it's not that many. So these are just programs in terms of the number of positions that each program has. That I do not know. It's a field that will continue to grow. So don't lose hope because of these numbers. So now I just wanted to give you like an example of the day in the life of an infectious disease pharmacist. So let's say they come in at 9 a.m. So one thing that could happen is that they may follow up on endorsements that were given to them from the you know staff pharmacists or the pharmacists that were covering the evening and overnight shift. And these endorsements can be something like the doctor wrote an order for vancomycin for 14 days for a skin and soft tissue infection. Is that supposed to be the duration? This patient was initially MPO, but now the patient is tolerating feeds. So do you think that we should switch to oral? Etc. And let's just say that from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., you have to follow up on these things. Next, review post discharge ED positive cultures and follow up with recommendations. So sometimes a patient may come to the emergency room and they're having signs and symptoms that clearly shows that the patient has a UTI, but we are unable to, you know, collect the sample and also find out exactly what bacteria is causing it. So sometimes they may empirically start the patient on antibiotics and send the patient home. And once we get the results of the cultures, we usually follow up with the patient depending on the, or the microorganism that grew in the culture. So if the microorganism that grew in the culture is susceptible to the medication that we initially send the patient home with, then you know the patient is good, we leave it. If not, then you know you might wanna call the patient, tell the patient to stop taking this medication, and then the prescriber must send a new prescription for the antibiotic that may cover the microorganism. 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., I do consults with the infectious disease physicians. 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., this is like the perfect scenario, right? You work in the hospital, inpatient, and then towards the end of the day, you go to the clinic and, you know, provide MTM and counsel patients on their medications. And that will be the end of this video. If you guys like these kind of videos, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If there's anything that you want me to clarify or anything that you want me to go over for the future videos, because as I mentioned, I will be doing different pharmacy specialties and you know practice sites so that we can all learn and acknowledge the diversity in terms of opportunities that pharmacists have. Make sure to leave a comment in the description about which pharmacist I should go over next. Connect with me on these social media platforms. Thank you for watching this video and take care.